Our starting point for this trip is Elko. From there, we drive north on Highway 225 for about 65 miles to Wild Horse State Recreation Area. This is our first visit to Wild Horse, so we've arranged to meet a pair of locals, Bill Fraser and Pat Riles. They love it out here, and they're going to show us around. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Hey, Patrick. Hey, Mary. Thanks for coming Thanks out. Thanks for coming to meet well, us here. Thank you. Nice here meeting go. you. Heading out that way? You bet. Ready to nah. boat. I like this boat. It is a lot of fun. Getting out on a boat on a perfect day like this is reward enough for me, but for Bill and Pat, the fun at Wild Horse is in the fishing. So what are the fish in Wild Horse? You've got brown trout, you've got uh, rainbows, which are stalkers, and then you've got a few natives. We've got uh, transplanted wipers, catfish. What are your favorite to eat? Mine is brown trout. I do think trout. Trout? Yep. The catfish are really good. The wipers are to die for. A lot of people just love them. In fact, my wife told me to be sure to catch enough for supper tonight. <laughs> Can you tell when it's on the line before you see it what kind of fish you're fighting? Not necessarily. Normally, if you catch a fish and they stay down low, you know it's either a big cat or a big wiper. But normally the trout will come up to the top, see the boat, and take off again. So as fishermen, is the fight more fun or the actual eating of the fish more fun? Fight. The fight? The fight. <laughs> yeah, I play them until they get tired. Yeah. And then they're easy to get catch. Stretch it out. Yeah, that's that's what it's all about. Yeah. It's just the excitement of the catching them. It just depends on the type of year if they're good or not. The colder the water, the more firm the fish are. Really? Yeah, and they taste a lot better. So what you're saying to me is there are good years and bad years for fish, like for wine. Yes. Yeah. I've never heard that before. So <laughs> but do you ever go to the freezer and go, here was a nice 2012 brown, brown <laughs> trout. They don't last that long. <laughs> this is a cold water lake, right? Well, actually it's what, about 65 degrees now well, in the water? it's uh, 68 right now. 68, there's the temperature. There's 30 inches of ice at times. Yeah, it, oh, wow. it's good, good well, solid New, ice. New Year's Eve, it was 41 below zero. 41 below. <laughs> oh my God. I didn't realize that any place in Nevada got that cold. I don't think I own enough sweaters for that. We do a lot of ice fishing. Oh, do you? Oh, yes. Well, this is kind of the fishing paradise, is what you're saying. You can fish year round, ice, summer, you can do it all. That's cool. It is. It's a fantastic lake. Just to enjoy it, there's so many things to do, you just can't imagine. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's easy to understand why you enjoy being out here so much. Wildlife abounds on the water and along the shoreline. As we cruise along, we see geese, ducks, and deer. And we even catch sight of some eagles. What is the biggest fish you've ever caught? Out here, well, I caught a nine pound wiper. I would say about this long, yeah. About like that? Yeah. Okay, now what's the real size? <laughs> now this is a really scenic area. Oh, those wildflowers are moving. Oh, those wildflowers are popping. Well, it's a lot nicer when we get up to the canyon here. Wild Horse Reservoir began with the construction of a dam in the late 1930s. It filled what was once the Owyhee Meadows. Oh, there's the dam. There's the dam. About 30 years after the first dam, a new, stronger one replaced the original, and that's what you see today. Bill and Pat have been excellent ambassadors for Wild Horse and provided us with a wonderful first impression. They return us to the dock, and we make a stop at the Information Center where we meet the ranger, Andrew Bass. Andrew, Hi. thank you so much. You're welcome. We had a great time out on the reservoir. It, it, beautiful. Yeah, it is awesome. You know, this time of year with the, you know, the blue skies and the nice water and the full lake. What else do people love to come out and do here? Well, obviously we have a campground here, so uh, people come out and go camping. They used the state park in the surrounding area as a base camp to go explore the surrounding area. You know, camp here, go out on the reservoir, do your boating, got fishing, 
if you want to do some water skiing, other water recreation, and then just exploring the backcountry. Fall, of course, a lot of people use it as their base camp for going hunting, so it's a lot to do. It is pretty remote, so where should a person go for resources, or what should they bring with them? Well, it is remote, and uh, the closest town of significant size is going to be Elko. And the first rule would be never leave Elko without a full tank of gas and all the supplies you need. There is no services out here, so just make sure you have everything before you leave town. And then when you get out here, good maps, GPS's, stopping in um, at the local places and asking road conditions. That reminds me that we are going even further into the remote area later uh, today as we're heading toward Jarbage. I would love to know from your perspective, what's the best route to take? So yeah, you've already traveled, you know, near 70 miles from the closest services and now you're gonna head out another 50 plus miles into no man's land out there. You know, and there's just not much, although there are some services in Jarbage that you can rely on when you get there. But there's nothing between here and there or between here and town. So uh, there's three primary routes for going out to Jarbage. My recommendation is that you take the route directly across the highway from the state park. It's uh, up what we call Gold Creek Road. It's definitely, I would say, one of the most recommended trips taken from this area. On our way out, we get our state park's passport stamped and then hit the road to Jarbage. We're looking forward to this drive, which we understand is beyond scenic. We've just started driving and it's already getting pretty. This pond with all the wildflowers inspires us to take a few pictures before we drive on. After a few miles more, we're beginning to understand why so many people love the journey to Jarbage. So this is Sunflower Reservoir. This is incredible. I cannot think of a better name for that. This, oh, wow. Suddenly we're in the forest. <laughs> we got a little elevation, I guess, and now there's lots of trees and this great canyon. It keeps coming, one spectacular vista after another. <laughs> that was phenomenal. We're following the Bruno River Loop, which winds its way from Penrod Creek through the canyons alongside Meadow Creek, then across the Bruno River and up into the high desert along the border of Idaho. It's all dirt road, over 50 miles of it, and some of it's quite rough, so you really don't want to try this in any vehicle you don't trust completely. We actually cross into Idaho for just a few minutes before turning back south and making the final few miles into Jarbage. After what felt like an epic journey, we finally made it to Jarbage, and we look forward to exploring it in the morning. Jarbage is the most remote town we've ever visited. The locals tell us there are 12 year-round residents, and that increases to about 50 in the summer. But even so, there seems to be no shortage of activity here, with campers and hikers flocking to the famously beautiful Jarbage Wilderness. We want to get to know this town, so who better to ask than a couple of longtime residents who grew up here? Virgil Larios and Fred Thatcher were schoolboys here back in the 40s, so they know pretty much everything about this town. This is the part of the outdoor end, still owned by Dot. Dot and Jack bought the bar, I think, in 1970 or thereabouts. Well, I think it's fun, the idea of staying in a barn. Yeah. yeah. Chris grew up on the, in the farm. She probably feel really <laughs> at home. Barns can be kind of comfortable, especially with the right accommodations. <laughs> So Virgil, I know your family goes back even before there was a Jarbage, right? 
the word is, as I've heard it, how much of it's true and how much of it's not, I'm not sure, but my grandfather came in around 1904, 1905. It grew into a fairly big ranch, bought his mining claim and stayed on Buck Creek till he died. My grandmother on my mother's side came into Jarbridge from Missouri right at the start of the big gold deal here in Jarbridge around 1909. And so that's when she met your grandfather? When she came here, she was actually married to one of the Crisp twins who were pretty famous here in Jarbridge. And later she divorced him and married his best friend. <laughs> Fred, when did your family come to Jarbidge? We came here in 1948. My uncle was working for the Forest Service, and my aunt says, why don't you bring your kids and come up and spend the summer? And we came in 1948, and we've never left. <laughs> and so when did you meet Virgil? 48. 48? Probably the same day he hit yeah. town. <laughs> That's a big thing. Somebody come to town in them days it was big news. Deal. So you guys have been walking this street together since 1948? Yep, since 48. <laughs> Speaking of good stories and names, of course, we gotta ask, why is Jarbage called Jarbage? Well, it started from the Indian Jahabich. I call it home. Well, and that's kind of what Jarbage is to us. Nice. I think I'm just going to start calling it the uh, Sahabits. <laughs> See if I can bring that back. <laughs> what did you guys do as young men in a town like this with your spare time? We, we fought a lot. We fought. <laughs> really? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> each other or? The yeah, each other, yeah. <laughs> and Virgil. this guy has got no quit in him. <laughs> I beat him up and then he chased me home. So I'd have to stop and beat him up before we got home. He beat me up three or four times before we got to his house. I think I can still take him. <laughs> did you play in the water? Did you play Absolutely. near the water? We dammed it up and swam in it. We'd swim in it sometimes a day or two before Christmas. Oh my gosh. What's it like being here when it's as cold as it gets in the wintertime? Do you guys just stay inside all day? We never stayed inside. <laughs> it, really. was, it was hard to keep us inside at school. We was always busy doing something. <laughs> We probably belonged in that jailhouse over there. That's probably where we belonged. This jail may not look like much, but it has some real history attached to it. Back in 1916, these walls held the man who robbed a mail delivery stage and killed the driver. That was the last stage robbery in the Old West. That case also featured the first use of a bloody palm print as evidence to earn a conviction. Luckily, that kind of stuff wasn't happening anymore when Virgil and Fred were growing up here. You know, and I think about it, and I tell people today, you got to remember our world was only that wide. But think about how much you lived in that. Yeah, well, we did. That was our whole world. Right here's the first two houses I remember living in as a kid in oh, 45 really? and 46. You lived in both of these? We lived in this one and slept in this one. Oh, wow. The house I mainly grew up in up down here, well, it was one of the nicest houses in town in 1940. Today, I'd call it pretty much a shack. <laughs> right. Now, is the house that you lived in as a kid, is it still here? Yes, we still have it. And that's where we stay. Oh, so you're still in cabin. staying in the house that you grew up in. Right. My mom bought that log cabin in about 1950 for $600. I got a little history about this cabin too. That's the same damn gate that was there 70 years ago. <laughs> Are you telling him that he needs to put a new gate I on I keep his telling house? that. It has a <laughs> sentimental value. Absolutely. <laughs> I would think that in a town this small, 
Everybody knows everybody and families are very close. Yeah, yeah they were. You know what was neat about growing up here? We always had something to do. I like to fish, so there's fish everywhere. Over this mountain is Deer Creek. Over this mountain is Jack Creek. I never remember being bored. What does garbage mean to you now? It means home to me. Home, yep. It means home. We always say we're going back home. It's just something special you can't take away. This is where we learned to dance. This is where we learned to dance. Had a jukebox in there. Might even been where we learned to drink beer. <laughs> it had more than a jukebox. There was a bar, too, and it's still in here. The homeowner, Darren Skelton, restored it to look like it did back in the day when the guys learned to dance and to do other things. We did learn how to drink there because we'd go out back and when they'd throw the bottles away, there'd be a little bit left. We'd <laughs> pour it all together and party off of that. <laughs> you guys did know how to find travel, didn't you? We did. Hope you don't fight anymore, though. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> that hurts too much. <laughs> you know, my life here, when I was a kid, I wouldn't trade it for anything. We got a lot of history from Virgil and Fred, and we didn't even walk the entire length of town. We could listen to their stories all day, 